Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Hey, all right. Good morning, VXV. Great to be with you on the Lord's Day once again. Let's open our Bibles now to the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We made it down to verse 33 the last time we were together. <clears throat> That's where we'll pick it up today. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12 and verse 33. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we as Americans, we talk a lot. All right, we, we are some talking fools. We, we like to talk an awful lot. The, the average American individual is going to engage on average in about 30 conversations a day. Now, some of us will engage in more, some of us less, but on average, we have around 30 conversations in any given day. I, I, I do not know who looks into these things, but evidently there are people that do. <clears throat> Excuse me. You are going to <clears throat> man, let's get that frog out of there. You, you are going to spend about 13 years of your waking life just talking. All right? 13 years. Again, some less, some more. My friend Stacy Gearhart could probably push that to 30 years. <laughs> if we were to somehow record every word that you spoke. Today, we could write a book 50 to 60 pages long. And over the course of a year, if we used just your words, we could author 264 books, each containing 200 pages or more. Perhaps on the more practical side of this, Apollo 11 astronaut Michael Collins, he once said this uh, at a banquet just prior to his death. It's been said that the average man speaks 25,000 words a day. And the average woman, 30,000. Unfortunately, when I come home each day, I've spoken my 25,000, and my wife hasn't started hers. Now, that could be a problem for a brother, right? What Jesus is going to be telling us to begin our time together is that these words that come out of our mouths, and they are many, unless you're Dan your heart. That's a very interesting marriage there, right? But the words that come out of our mouths, they are going to reveal what it is that is inside of our hearts. In fact, he is going to say this down in verse 37. Get ready for this. Jesus will say, for by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be Condemned. Now, now, if you want to talk about reason enough to watch what it is that comes out of your mouth, I would suggest to you verse 37 is it, right? Now, does that shock some of you? By your words you are justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Does that strike you as funny? Because we know that we're not saved by our speech, right? Ephesians chapter 2 clearly spells out we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and not 
by works. In other words, not by what we say or do, but by what Jesus has done. And so what is it exactly that Christ is trying to communicate here? And we'll get to that this morning. But that is going to begin for us by getting ourselves back into the scene and into the flow and the ever-important context uh, of Matthew chapter 12. Now, Jesus will still be talking to these Pharisees that he was speaking to the last time we were together, but the tone now is going to shift rather significantly. You remember the last time we were together, Jesus took one more shot at the bow, across the bow, at trying to reach some of these men within the community of Pharisees that have now determined this Jesus must die, and now all that remains is figuring out how. This is the big shift in the 12th chapter of Matthew. It was here in verse 14 that these religious leaders have determined that Jesus is a threat. He is too much for us. We are going to have to figure out a way to kill him. Uh, Last week, uh, we saw two things that, in my estimation, were absolutely stunning. Number one, Jesus, a very busy man at this point in his ministry, there was a sea of people around him trying to bring their sick to him. And while he is healing a a deaf and dumb demon-possessed man, he hears the thoughts of his enemies at some distance from him, stops what he is doing, puts the sea of people around him on hold, and he goes and tries to reason with the very community of men that want to kill him. Last week we said, who in the world does that, right? We don't even talk to our enemies, let alone have their thoughts on our radar, right? How many of you this past week, hopefully more than prior to last week, how many of you have thought about the spiritual condition of those who oppose you? Hopefully more than one. And probably still not many of us. And so Jesus, seeing things very differently from the likes of us, he goes and takes what I would call his last shot at giving some of these Pharisees a way out of the burning building. We read last week that uh, really was what we read last week was his last call uh, to the sal- for salvation to these men. And from our text today, one might say it appears that some have heeded that call. But the first thing we were struck by was the excellence of the heart of Christ still pursuing his enemy, still pursuing the most stubborn of men, still having an ear to the wall for those who oppose him. What an excellent, excellent heart. And I, for one, am ever so grateful that he continued to pursue this stubborn man after just decades of stupidity, all right? And so, really, the second thing that I thought was absolutely stunning about our text, we learned some things, didn't we? Jesus lays out, it's just a protocol, he lays out this spiritual truth for them in healing this demon-possessed man, and they do not understand what is right before their very eyes. They don't see the picture. What was the picture that Jesus came to set at liberty those who are captive, And so through an extraordinary sequence of events, and we certainly don't have time to catalog all of that again, but through an extraordinary sequence of sovereign, just very carefully provident events, God sees to it that these men can see probably one or two or maybe three of them choose Christ, and the others' hearts were hardened beyond Repair. Now, today in our text, we'll be dealing with those who were hardened beyond repair and the judgment that's going to fall upon them. But the second beautiful thing in that passage to me was how God will lay out before you and I a particular spiritual truth. If we somehow do not see it, the hound of heaven will begin to flex his sovereign muscle and quite literally like bend time and space in orchestrating a series of provident events until we finally see in a new and heightened light what was right before us the whole time, right? It is my deep prayer that we have something of that experience today in dealing with the subject of unbelief. Now, 
What many of us do not realize but should is that regardless of whether an individual makes a decision for Christ, God is going to be glorified. Right? You say, how is that possible? I will tell you. God is either going to be glorified in mercy or God is going to be glorified in justice. Each and every one of us in this room, we will end up glorifying God. The the question that remains is, will you glorify his mercy? Or will you glorify his justice? I do not think you want the latter. And the really scary part about the latter, and we saw this in chapter 11, right? The scary part about glorifying God in the exercising of his justice is that we are going to be judged. Listen very carefully, prominent theme in our text today. We are going to be judged by the amount of light that has been given us. Okay? We are going to be judged by the amount of light that has been given us. Remember what Christ said in Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is what? Expected, required. We're gonna see that in our passage today. And now what happens in our text gets very interesting because right after Jesus takes his last shot at saving them, these Pharisees then come back, not not all of them, which is interesting, But those that come back will recoil like the vipers they are, and now they will kind of quid pro quo and take their last shot at him. His last shot was to save. Their last shot is to condemn. And so very telling. We've got final shots being fired by both sides here. A very interesting contrast in Matthew 12. Now, with only the rotten among them left we can now expect Jesus to get very aggressive with these men, all right? The Pharisees that are left, they are now the enemies of Christ and the enemies of the glory of God because not only have these men rejected Christ, but they have now taken up the ministry to get others to reject him as well. You know, we'll get to this in chapter 18, but the Bible talks about a very special place in hell for those human beings that want to get between Christ and the people of God made in his image. And we'll get to that soon enough. And so where we left off was these men had committed the unpardonable sin, right? Which Jesus called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, perhaps the most misunderstood term in all of Matthew's gospel. Everybody's always always wants to talk about what is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Well, well, it's not eating Pop-Tarts on the Sabbath, all right? No, I mean, that's not what it is. The context was these men, in saying that Jesus is satanic, they have not only rejected the testimony of the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus is God manifested in the flesh to save human sin, but they called him Beelzebub. Maybe they sang Bohemian Rhapsody. I don't know. But it's game over for these guys. Like They are calling the living God manifested in the flesh an emissary of Satan, right? And in doing so, have committed the most slanderous crime in the history of the planet. They said of the lovely spotless gift from heaven that he was from hell. That is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That is rejecting the saving knowledge of Christ. The only thing, the only thing that God cannot forgive is rejecting the Holy Spirit's testimony of who Christ is and what he came to do, okay? And so now where we pick it up today, Jesus is going to be saying to these men and indeed saying to you and I, look, the words that leave your mind You better, the words that leave your mouth, you better choose them very carefully because you are telling the rest of us what is in your heart. If we want to know what is in your heart, all that we have to do is listen to what you say long enough, all right? And so Christ has taken his last last shot this uh, last week, 
This week, we are going to see some of these Pharisees take theirs, and now Christ will take the occasion of this last attack and turn it into a stinging discourse on judgment. For you and I, sitting in the church in the year of our Lord, 2022, the Lord is going to be dealing with whatever degrees of unbelief may remain in us, uh, and he is going to showcase for us yet again, as he always does, the incomparable beauty and value and excellence of Jesus. Tremendous study on deck yet again. Let's go to work again here, here in verse 33 of Matthew chapter 12. We get after it now. Matthew 12 and verse 33. Let's go. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. <laughs> That's what you say when you want to get people to like you, right? And talking about the Pharisees here, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. And so these Pharisees that remain now, they're not damned because of the actual words that come out of their mouth. They are damned because of the corrupt hearts uh, from which these words come forth, right? Are you with me? Because if you are, you have the substance of this passage. Now, let's look at the simple truth on the surface here, and then we've got a number of interesting layers for your prophet in mind right here on the ground today. Now, first of all, what is the basic, what is the basic truth here? It is this. A tree is known by its fruit. Okay, now this is a simple parabolic axiom, okay? Uh, it, it is a statement of truth, a truism if you prefer. A good tree produces good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit, therefore a tree is known by its fruit. This is the very same thing that Jesus says in Luke chapter 6. Christ is simply saying here that we can tell what kind of a person you are by the fruit that you produce. Now, no doubt part of the implication here is Christ saying, boys, look, if I'm such a bad guy, then why is it that I'm doing all of these wonderful things in your community? Right? I mean, can you tell me that? If I am working for the prince of darkness, why are your people being healed? Why are people being set free from bondage? Why do the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk? Does that sound like rotten fruit to you, to you boys? Oh, well, no, it does not. And I think they're probably hearing that, but I believe the better part, certainly contextually, the better part of what Jesus is saying here and what becomes more obvious and primary as the passage unfolds is this is not a justification of Christ as much as it is an indictment upon these Pharisees. Because notice in verse 34 there, right? He says, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak? what is good. So the fruit that we are talking about now are the words that leave our mouths, right? That is what is in view here in this passage, the evil words that have just left the mouth of these Pharisees in calling Jesus an emissary of Satan. There's your connect connection to last week, right? That is the toxicity that has come out of their mouths, revealing, listen now, an overflow from their toxic, evil hearts. What, what does that mean? It means this. Notice now perhaps the most popular text in our passage, though perhaps not in this translation. Notice Christ concluded at the end of verse 34, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Now, the King Jimmy and the ESV have the more popular version probably, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I love the way the NIV puts it there, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, 
Okay, probably the best translation right there. This is the major principle in our immediate passage. From out of our mouths comes what the heart is full of. In other words, whatever you are on the inside is eventually going to spill out of your mouth. Let's pop the hood. Now, that word for fills or abundance or full of there. Very interesting Greek word there. That, that, that is perisuima, and it means a surplus. It means a, a super abundance. It means an overflow, an excess. The idea here is that the heart is just jammed full of something, and it's got to have an overflow valve, right? And that overflow valve is your mouth, And so in the Greek here, Christ is saying there is this reservoir in your heart and and whatever is in there is eventually going to spill out through your mouth. Here's an illustration from uh, the Word of God to give you an example of how this works out of the 32nd chapter of Job. You've got Elihu if you remember the story, who has listened for who knows how long to all of Job's other three idiot friends bloviating, right? And now he has just got to get his two cents in or he's going to blow, all right? And he says this, and he's the good one, by the way. I will say my peace, I will speak my mind, for I am here. Here's the flow of this word here, but I see him, I am full of pent up words and the spirit within me urges me on. I I am like a cask of wine without a vent, like a new wineskin ready to burst. I must speak to find relief. There's the vow, right? So let me give my answers. In other words, look, I have just got to get some relief here. And the only way I can get relief from what is spilling all over the place in my heart is to open up my cake hole and blow. All right? That's why some of us cuss in a fit of anger. Your mouth, it is a valve releasing what it is your heart is full of. You should know that. Do you want to know your own heart? Listen to what you say when you think nobody is around, or even when they are. Listen to those 25,000 words. Listen to those 25,000 words. They will tell you. The problem is, even when there's nobody around, there is always somebody around. That somebody is the Lord, and we'll deal with that in a minute in verse 36 and verse 37. Now, how is it then that that we can manage what goes in the tank? I mean, if this is what's coming out, like how do we manage what is going in? Well, notice verse 35 here. For the good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. Now, that word for treasure there, thesaras, thesaras, okay? It means a storehouse, a treasure chest. It's a chamber, all right? It's a box where you would deposit something of value. This word was used in Matthew chapter 2 for the wise men who brought their boxes with treasures to Christ in. And so, so allow me to make this as simple as I can for you. You have a box that is within you, all right? And the only thing you can get out of that box is what you are putting into it. For out of the abundance of the box, if you will, the mouth speaks. Now, VXV, what what is it that you are putting in your box? What are you putting in that chest of yours? In, In other words, what are you watching? What are you looking at? What are you listening to? Who, who are you hanging out with, right? Because that is what your box is going to to be filled with and ultimately what is going to come flowing out of your box through that valve, your mouth, right? Through that overflow valve. Now, this is why, brothers and sisters, it is so critical for you to be filling your thesaras, your treasure, treasure chest with the true treasure of God's word, right? Not just on Sunday, but as often as you can find the time to dine on the divine. Remember this from Matthew chapter 4? 
Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Far and away, the most important thing that you can do to flourish as a human being is to regularly drink deeply from the infinite fount of God's word. Husbands, we are commanded to do that, are we not? Right? Paul says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, wash your wives in the water of God's word. See to it that your wives have time to get in the word. Ephesians 5, 26. Look, we get a lot of garbage on our feet. We get, we get a lot of garbage on our clothes and our... We just pick up a lot of gunk walking out there in this filthy world, do we not? And we need to cleanse ourselves. That cleansing agent is the living water of the word of God. Listen, I'll make it even simpler for you. Garbage in, garbage out. All right? If you do not like what is coming out of your life... Take a good and hard look at what it is that you are allowing to come into your life, right? Take a look at what's coming in and and begin to tweak that spiritual diet a bit. Now let's back up to verse 33, having said that, because I believe we have a very interesting nuance in the text that suggests this very thing, all right? So this passage here... This is not like its companion passage in Luke chapter 6. And the point of differentiation here is, notice he says, make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. He uses the verb poieo. This is a second person active imperative with a very wide application in the Greek. It means here to abide, to agree, to commit. There's a, there's a, um, a mental element to this, this word poieo. You're, you're considering, you're thinking, you're evaluating. Again, active imperative, meaning this is something you are doing. Right? Not passive. This is an active imperative. And so there's a sense in which it's saying you want good fruit? Make the tree good. All right? You want bad fruit? Well, You can choose to make poieo, the tree, bad. And so if we're digging a little deeper here, coming right off of Jesus presenting two options the last time we were together, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven or there's outright rejection. There's a wonderful nuanced sense in which this is saying, look, choose Christ, make the tree good. And you will produce good fruit. You don't do that, the tree's going to go bad, and you're going to have bad fruit. Now, case in point, and this is the final thing we'll look at here, here's what bad fruit looks like, man. That here is what rejecting Christ looks like. Notice the amazing imagery here. He calls these guys a brood of vipers. Imagery just pregnant with insight, carefully chosen. This word for brood here is genema, and it means literally offspring. It can also mean generation. And echidna, and this is a poisonous snake, a viper. Very interesting to me, he is calling these men the children of poisonous snakes. Okay? Now, a brood, uh, for those of you fans of Wild Kingdom, a, a brood would be a mother producing anywhere between 15 and 50 snakes at a time. Okay, a brood. And so Jesus, you know, as Jesus sees these men running around in their little black robes, they looked to him like a little brood of snakes, all commingled together with poisonous evil intent. Now, the viper is a most interesting image because vipers like to hide, right? Vipers try to blend in with their environment so that you cannot sense them. This is what false teachers do, don't they? They like to hide so that you cannot sense them. How many of these vipers can you find? It can get pretty tricky, can it? They can be right under your nose and you would not know it. And then once they do get you, they will just cling to a person's flesh while pumping their poison into them, right? The Apostle Paul dealt one of these, uh, 
dealt with one of these. I think it was Acts 28. Uh, it, it did not want to let him go. A good thing there was a fire there now. And so these are deceptive, highly toxic snakes. We don't need the, obvi- uh, the obvious connection to Satan, right? Deceptive, highly toxic snakes, and they can be very difficult to discern. And so you, do, do you at once see how, how well thought out this image was, right? And why Christ created these animals in order to use the book of nature as yet another valuable object lesson here. False teachers are very sneaky snakes, and it is their desire to render themselves undetected until they can just appeal to you and appeal to your flesh. Oh, you're so good. You're so awesome. You're so spiritual. That's, that's that thing grabbing on and pumping you with that poison of self, right? And they'll just grab right onto you and pumping your soul full of the poison of false doctrine. Okay? Wonderfully deliberate, intentional pregnant with insight image inspired by the spirit of God chosen by Christ here. Now, from time to time, I have been known to get fairly aggressive with false doctrines and false teachers. It is, I believe, polemics are part and parcel to any uh, a faithfully executed pastoral office. Now, when you choose that faithful road, you are going to pinch some toes, all right? You're going to offend some people. I, I consider myself an equal opportunity offender. And, and look, man, I, I understand it's not a pleasant thing. I, I get it. It is not a pleasant thing to discover you've been reading or sitting under false teaching, but never have I called anybody a brood of vipers. So, my point is understand how severe Christ takes false teaching and false doctrine, all right? Well, now we get to that difficult statement we looked at to begin. Let's bring it around now. Notice he says in verse 36, but I tell you that every careless word, some of you have the word idle in your translations, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it. Notice now, in the day of judgment. Underline that. This is not the Bema seat, all right? This is not the believer's reward bench in view here. This is the great white throne judgment. I tell you, every careless or idle word that people speak, they shall give an account for it in the day of judgment if you be an unbeliever. And that's the context. Now you know verse 37. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now, notice he begins here with, but I tell you, okay? Or or you might have, therefore, I say to you. This is the same I say to you formula that we saw in verse 31 when Christ introduced the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, in which we've seen a number of times in the Sermon on the Mount. Verily, verily, I say unto you, right? And this is telling us, look, what follows is significant. Pay attention, Right now, what's what else is is very very interesting about this? Uh, th- this is great for me. Quite unexpectedly, all right. This is for you Bible students. Quite unexpectedly, at least grammatically speaking, Jesus now makes a hard shift into the second person singular in verse thirty six. He's now he's talking about you and your and you and your and you and you there. And this is now telling us that Christ is now fanning this out and broadening this out, not just to the Pharisees, but to everybody gathered around in this sea of people with an earshot of of the conversation, which, which of course includes you and I today reading this inspired text. And so it's, I say to you, and now I'm talking to everybody here, listen to what I have to say. Now, what does he have to say? Well, again, let's, let's first dispense with what this does not mean, okay? And we will go into Ephesians 2. We will go into Ephesians 2 here to get this straight. This does not mean when he says, for by your words you're justified and by your words you're condemned, this does not mean that we are not saved by grace alone. You, you know this text, right? But let's read it again. 
For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift, right? The gift of God, not as a result of works or words. Words are a type of work, all right? Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. And, and I think at this time, you've seen this enough. I, I think most of us understand this, but then look at the very next verse. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would um, walk in them. So Paul is saying here, we are saved by grace through faith. And being then saved by grace through faith, the good works and the good words that are there, they are simply evidence pointing back to the fact that we have been saved. This should not be difficult. This is a theme throughout the whole of the New Testament, uh, particularly um, one of the major themes, if not the major theme, in the epistle of James. Uh, Again, keeping it super simple, all right? Let's keep it super simple here. We don't do good things to get saved, but saved people do good things. Because over time, the Lord transforms our hearts and gives us better, higher appetites. Now then, what this does mean comes from our context, right? What did the Lord just tell us? What did he already tell us? It is, the, it is out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks, right? So the words coming out of your mouth, they are going to give evidence of either a justified heart or a condemned heart. Okay, and Jesus is using hyperbole yet again here as he often does with his hardened enemies to strengthen his point. You, uh, you're not saved by your words, but your words point to a heart that is saved or not. Okay? And while grammatically he is addressing everybody here, there is no doubt in my mind that Christ is stealing a glance over at the Pharisees' direction, letting these boys know, look, This poisonous evil that has proceeded from your mouths, that is clear evidence of condemned hearts. By your words, boys, you are showing yourselves to have condemned hearts. Okay? Now, what does all of this mean to you and I? I think two things practically. Number one, I think we've been given a wonderful barometer here right? I mean, if we were to somehow put a bug in your car and your phone in your home, if we were to run audio surveillance on you 24-7 for a week, my strong guess is, having never met you, we could easily discern whether you were a person of faith or whether you were a person of unbelief. And therefore, since wherever you go, there you are, you can apply this to your own heart, right? Not talking about the slip-ups, all right? We'd all be in trouble. Not talking about tempers, not talking about character flaws. None of us are without sin, 1 John 1, right? But you ought to be able to listen to the general tenor of the words in your brain and in your mouth and have a pretty good idea if the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Here's a surefire way to tell. Here's a hack for you, all right? How do you feel after you've blown it? Do you want to argue? Do you want to blame others? Do you feel nothing like no conviction at all? There's nothing there. And really good idea to make an appointment with one of your pastors. The second thing I think practically is a little tricky, but I want to prevent us, look at me, I want to prevent us from making the opposite error, okay? I want to prevent us from making the opposite error here as well. Every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it. This word for careless or idle in your translation. This is argos in the Greek, and it means lazy. It means barren, all right? It means 
idol. And it has the idea of a, a broken promise or a broken vow, an unpaid obligation, right? In other words, you said you would do something and you did not deliver. And so it was an idle word, a barren word, an empty, unproductive word. Now, these Pharisees are claiming to exist to serve God, but they are not. They're driving people away from God. Their entire existence, every word that ever comes out of their mouth Every word that ever came out of the mouths of these hardened spiritual criminals, they were barren. They were empty, right? Utterly unproductive. A complete betrayal, Argos. Now, the reason that I give you the Greek word Argos and the context here is because I have seen, pay attention, excessive interpretive ignorance here with this text turn otherwise good and conscientious believers into humorless, pedantic legalists who are afraid to relax and engage in any kind of social banter. Like, you are not going to hell because you joke about from time to time. All right? Your God does not want you uptight because your God is not uptight. If you have an uptight God, then you do not know the God of joy that is presented in the scriptures. Knowing what we know and where this is all going, have I not told you believers we should be the most joy-filled people on the planet? And so I should think a word of caution, we should tread a bit lightly here and recognize that, look, that the judgment that this is looking to contextually, again, this is not the Bema seat of 2 Corinthians 5 or 1 Corinthians 3, all right? This is not the believer's reward bench here. That's not what we're talking about. But rather, again, what is in view here is the day of judgment. We are talking about what is called, you can read about this in the book of Revelation, the great white throne judgment where every unproductive, empty, broken, barren word spoke by the unbelieving soul because they do not have the imputed righteousness of Christ upon them by faith. They are going to be condemned for those things. Believers will not even appear at the great white throne. You should rejoice in that because the blood of Christ has covered your sin. All of it. Yes, we've sinned with our tongues. Yes, we sin with our mouths and will from time to time, time to time. James 3, 2, right? But ours are under the covering of Christ. However, what is clear and what we should pay attention to is that the words that come out of our mouths, they are an excellent barometer of the present condition of our hearts. And if we want to advance further into the depth of his joy, we would do well to search our own hearts by our own words. Why? Man, I've told you this before. Because if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged you should cut that verse out, blow it up, copy it, and put it on your fridge, right? I've told you this before. I will tell you again. If you, Christian, want to save yourself a whole lot of grief by way of daddy's discipline, begin to make it a habit to search your own heart. Today we're learning you can do that by your words. Now, I do not know how much time has passed between verse 37 and verse 38, uh, but notice the Pharisees now, they've picked themselves right back up off the floor, reconvened, and now they emerge before Christ again with a rather bizarre request, given all that they've seen Christ do, considering all that he has done. Mark it very carefully here, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees, isn't that interesting? Some, we've got a limiting article that was not there before. Interesting. Christ has given his last shot across the bow, and now we've got a limiting article. I find that fascinating. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, teacher, 
So these are the boys that remain. We want to see a sign from you. Are you serious? Do we understand where we are in Matthew's gospel on the other side of the miracle mile? Do we understand what these men have already seen? Right? And now they want to see a sign. You want another sign? Like, like this is your last shot? Notice his response, verse 39. But he answered and said to them, no. That's a paraphrase. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign, underline those words, no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, I have a little confession for you. I used to purposely say whale whenever I was talking about Jonah to ferret out picky Christians just to see who would email me and go, well, you know, it's not a whale. It says great fish. Uh, I, your pastor has grown since then, so. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm not going to hide some landmines in the future, though. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the... I'm sorry if you feel bad if you sent me an email. Uh, it's good for you. Bill's character. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days... This is the sign you're going to get. So will I be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, this just blew their mind. Like, we look back... We're reading this text and go, yeah, we know exactly what he's talking about. This was just a mind-bending prophecy at the time. Um, so let me get this straight. <laughs> you guys, you have seen the blind see and the deaf hear and the lame walk by the hand of Jesus several times over, right? You have seen multiple demoniacs delivered. You have seen a man in stage four leprosy healed, advanced leprosy, meaning fingers were growing back. Ears were popping back on heads. Grossly, uh, grotesquely disfigured skin was suddenly smooth as a baby's butt. And, and you want to see a sign? This is what unbelief does. All right? You remember the synagogue official's daughter back there in the Miracle Mile, Matthew 9? She was dead. Jesus shows up at a funeral and raises a dead human being back to life, and you want to see a sign? Right? In part, I believe this is here just to, to bring emphasis to the stupidity of a hardened heart. Now, we do know the Jews from the New Testament, right? The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.12 that Jews demand signs. All right, they were a sign, happy people. They loved them some signs. I and mean, these people probably never got lost. What do you mean you couldn't find the house? <laughs> but what we are reading here, this is recorded for us in the inspired scriptures that we might behold the abject absurdity of unbelief. Now, understand VXV, they are not looking for a sign in order that they might come to faith, all right? But rather, what they are asking for, what they are trying to accomplish here is to find something that he cannot do in order that they might justify their unbelief, to somehow try and discredit his claim to be God. And, and listen, we see the very same thing today. Solomon was right. There's nothing new, right? You will hear people say, now, hey, if God is real, well, look, God's going to heal my grandma with terminal cancer, right? And then if God doesn't heal grandma, well, then how can there be a God if in the most desperate hour of my life I ask you to show me that you're real and you don't? I mean, this is what unbelief does. It treats God as some kind of a cosmic genie, like, like rub a lamp and make this happen if you're really God, right? Never mind, the Bible says you shall not test the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 6, Luke 4, right? Which is what our Pharisees are finding out here, right? But people will say, well, I right. Now, I want you to make a unicorn appear in my backyard. And boy, if that happens, then I will know, God, that I need to follow you, right? 
but it works the other way too, doesn't it? This is unbelief. It works the other way too. When grandma does get better, unbelief says, well, wowee, would you look at all the advances in medical science? Crazy what technology can do. Boy, and of course the unicorn shows up, right? Boy, this evolution is just a fantastic thing, isn't it? Listen, people are not looking for miracles. They're not asking these things because of a desire to come to faith. They are simply seeking to manufacture excuses. You should know this. This is what you're dealing with. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, all men are without excuse, right? For since the creation of the world, his visible attributes... What are those? His eternal power and divine nature. What of them? Well, they have been clearly seen how being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Paul is telling us here that the visible things of the world, what you can see, touch, hear, they testify of, they give evidence of, the invisible attributes of God, the power of God, the creative genius of God, the beauty and symmetry and complexity of creation, the intelligent design, the wisdom of God. Paul is saying all of these things can be clearly seen so that in the day of judgment, you and I are going to be without excuse. You will not be allowed to raise the defense Well, you didn't heal my grandma, so come on, man. God, I didn't know. No. Now, because apologetics are part of our DNA, I'm going to take a brief detour here, but not really. I think what people um, need to ask themselves very seriously is, like, this is just simple, and I know you know this because you're enlightened, most of you, but I think what people need to ask themselves very seriously is, where did all of this come from? Right, like, where did the material realm, where did it come from? Because there are really only two possibilities. What God says and what man says. All right? Now, possibility number one, what God says is this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this is the very first sentence in your Bible. And if you can believe that, if you can get past that, then there is no reason at all for you to call into question any of the 31,173 verses that follow it. I've said this to you before. Jonah and the whale. People will struggle with a particular story in the Bible and say, well, you know, I just don't know about that deal, man. I I just, I I don't see it. Look, your problem is not with the story. Your problem is with Genesis 1-1. Case in point now, the story of Jonah, okay? And Jesus' response to these hardened men, all right, now you took your last shot, your last launch at my credibility here, and I am not in the business of accommodating hardened unbelief. No sign, right? It is an evil and adulterous people that look for a sign to discredit. But you will see what the rest of the world will see. It, you're, you're going to get one last sign. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Let me just say that one more time. Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights. Now, extraordinary picture of the death and resurrection of Christ in the story of Jonah. Oh, profound symmetry and prophecy there. Uh, If you want to marvel over what God has done there, and it is significant. Jonah's a picture of God going into the storm so we wouldn't have to. There's so much there. Go and grab, I think you can grab our entire study of Jonah in like four or five lessons. But Christ is here telling these men, I'm not going to give you a sign. No sign. I will not allow you to gaslight my messianic credentials here. All right? You want a real big sign? You're going to get one later in my death and resurrection. Of course, they're not getting this now, but one day will. That's how prophecy works. And so possibility number one here, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing, and all of a sudden, there was something. And that something 
was designed by an intelligent creator God. If you are a Christian and you find yourself struggling with the story of Jonah and the great fish, you do not have a problem with that. You have a problem with Genesis 1-1 that you're going to have to deal with, all right? If there is a God that can manufacture the heavens and the earth by the power of his spoken word, how is it that that same God cannot create some large biological submarine if just for that instant preserve a human life for three days and three nights just to see if you would understand what true belief in a supernatural God would mean? I'll let you chew on that this week. Why is there a material realm all around us? Possibility number one, because an intelligent God created it. Now, possibility number two is man's explanation. And when we we say man, we mean unbelieving man, all right? Now, the Humanist Manifesto says this. It says a whole lot of things, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Um, Matter is self-existing and not created, okay? So the humanist manifesto declares that there was no beginning, and yet there was. You know, we've got a theory for the beginning of something that came from nothing. But, you know, the the physical present universe as we know it today, the humanist manifesto says that, that there's no beginning. It's always existed. The universe, the physical universe that you know today has always existed. In other words, they, they, boiling down to my favorite platitude of all time, nothing plus nothing somehow equals everything. You know, there was a belt and a swamp and a lightning struck the belt and a cow came out of it. Yeah. All this crazy stuff. It's amazing what you have to spin. But, but, but so they believe that the universe has always existed and yet they promote this idea called the Big Bang Theory. You've got pulsating and oscillating universes that say everything existed before this bang. So there's, this started, but it really didn't because there's nothing and there is something, but there's nothing. We don't know how. It, it's, it's all very confusing. And at the end of the day, the human, uh, Humanist Manifesto says it is all philosophically, it's meaningless. We're, we're doing all this work to tell you that everything is without meaning. Sounds like a program I'd like to sign up for, right? Everything has always existed. There was no beginning. Now, we've got a number of problems with that. I'll give you three to keep it manageable this morning. Number one, the secular idea of an oscillating or pulsating universe, which has always existed, was shattered in 1992 when we discovered what we already suspected, that galaxies are actually expanding, right? Data appears to confirm multiple, multiple galactic expansion from a single point. You can read all about extragalactic astronomy, birthed by Edwin Hubble on your own time. The second problem with an eternal universe as we presently know it is our very own sun. Now, our sun, like trillions of other stars, they generate energy by thermal nuclear fusion. All right? Teachers know this, right? Don't they? And what that means is that every second, this massive fireball in the sky, our sun is compressing 564 million tons of hydrogen into 560 million tons of helium every second, releasing 4 million metric tons of matter in energy. Okay? Every second. In in other words... Our sun, like every other star in the universe, is running on hydrogen, okay? In the very same way that your car will only run for so long on a tank of very, very expensive gasoline. (laughs) Just like that, the universe will will one day run out of hydrogen. Now, praise God, we're not going to run out of hydrogen next week. But there will be a point in the future that the physical universe that we presently inhabit will cease to exist. Now, 
What the molecular structure of the new heaven and new earth will look like, we don't know that any more than we know what the molecular structure of these new bodies, our glorified bodies, will be. Point being, this present physical universe, the Bible says, is going to get packed away. But this present physical universe is not, as the atheists believe in their humanist manifesto, eternal. It was created. Okay? And I would love to to take you on a ride with this stuff all day because I personally love it, but we don't have the time. And then the third problem is a little something we call the second law of thermodynamics, all right? That says you can't get order, you don't get order out of chaos, but rather you have order and order turns into chaos. Now now look at your own body, all right? When you were 18, there was order there, right? I mean, you had the abs going, you could see your feet. Now look at you. You got disorder there, right? And so look, the universe, it is not eternal. Men are without excuse. And the only reason men like these men here continue to ask for a sign is because they are looking to justify their unbelief. The humanist ideology that nothing plus nothing equals everything is beyond stupid But if it means that I can order my life in any so way that I choose without consequence, I suppose I'll choose stupid. We practice an intelligent faith. Finally, this morning, verse 41. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, Something greater than Jonah is here. You do know that, right? Every single man of faith in the Old Testament was to point to one specific attribute that was made perfect in Christ. Marvel over his perfection in everything. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Like they was right there in front of them. They didn't have to travel, Right? Notice verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it. Watch, because she came from the ends of the earth. He's right there in front of you guys. Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, one lesser than Christ, right? She comes from the end of the earth to listen to one lesser than Christ. You guys have the son of the living God manifested in the flesh in your face. You see what he's doing here? And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Remember the book of Hebrews? He is better than, better than. All right. Well, with Jonah on the mind, our Lord closes this passage with the people of Nineveh on his mind. And the point he is making here is this. Look, again, Luke 12, 34. To whom much is given, much is expected, much is required. You and I, VXV, we will be held responsible for the amount of revelation that has been given to us. The point Christ is making here is the people of Nineveh and the queen of the south, that would be the queen of Sheba from 1 Kings 10 and 2 Chronicles 9, by the way. These were people that were given very limited light, right? And yet they repented and blessed God. How limited, Well, first of all, you had Jonah. You remember, took a short ride on a long fish, right? You remember Jonah? Oh, it was maybe the most hard-nosed. They take a while to sink in sometimes. It's okay. Um, Maybe the most hard-nosed individual you're ever going to find of all the believers in the Old Testament, right? Now, Now, you think about this. You think about this. You have got a man inside this large aquatic animal and he was in there for three days and three nights before he repented. You put me in the belly of that thing <laughs> inside of five seconds, I'm going to repent. I'm going to be making up sins to repent of, all right? I mean, can you imagine this man? The gastric juices are just eating away at his hair. Lord knows what it's doing to his complexion, right? I mean, the, the, the stink of dead fish guts all around the humidity had to be killer. And so after three days, he's finally, all right, fine, I repent. And he gets belched up there on the beach and starts walking to Nineveh, right? Now, now here's where the fun really starts. 
Here you are, the people of Nineveh, you are a very ungodly bunch, all right? And suddenly you've got this bleached white freak show with no hair, walking through the streets in tattered clothing, telling everybody, you're all going to die, all right? That's what, y'all, you know what's going to happen here? You all are going to die, right? It, and what happens? Everybody repents. I mean, from the king on down to the doorman, everybody in that city repents in sackcloth and ashes. Massive revival. Listen, they believed God with very limited light. Contrast that with all of our high-powered evangelism and all of our resources and tracks and polished material. Do we understand how this shows that salvation is all of God and not our ingenuity, right? But, but the point of this text is the people repented with very limited light, very limited revelation. What, what about these Jews who had tons of light? What about we who have yet more And then you've got the Queen of Sheba. This wealthy woman takes his entourage across the Arabian desert to meet this king she's heard so much about. She's blown away by the wisdom of God she encounters in Solomon. And so she proceeds to just dump treasure upon treasure upon Solomon. You say, why is this important? I'll give you the highlight reel because I'm out of time, all right? You have this Gentile pagan, idolatrous, godless, lawless, queen of a bunch of pagan people who traveled a great distance just to hear the wisdom of God from a man that was to point to Christ. And now here is Christ, the genuine article, one greater than Solomon, right in front of their noses, and they are rejecting the wisdom of God incarnate. Do we understand the depth of contrast here? Christ is saying, man, I'm, I'm tougher than Jonah. I am wiser than Solomon. And again, man, that is just scratching the surface VXV. He is better. Go back and study your Old Testament. He is a better father than Abraham, a better mediator than Moses, a better provider than Joseph, a better intercessor than Job, a better warrior than David, the very best. And all of these men were simply there to point you at point to attributes made perfect in Jesus. He is better. Can we even begin to understand and delight in how excellent and perfect and holy and beautiful and worthy he is? Because if we did, our hearts wouldn't be so captivated by lesser, inferior affections. That's why we're here. Let's land the plane. To whom much is given, much is expected. How much more have we been given than these first century Jews having the full counsel of God at our disposal with the cross of Calvary in our rearview mirror? How much more light have we been given than anybody who was watching this unfold? To whom much is given, much is expected. Now, what is it that is expected of us? And this is where we really need to remind ourselves why we are here. What is expected of us is that we would, with the resources and privileges at our disposal, pursue Christ as preeminent with everything that we've got. Because he is the preeminent treasure. He is the better treasure. Listen to me. I am not here to tell you to clean up your mouth and to straighten up and fly right so that you can be justified by God. No, no. If you are in Christ, you already have his perfect obedience on you. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21. It's there. Christian, I'm not here to tell you to watch your mouth. I'm here to tell you to watch his. No, am I saying you should go out and cuss like a drunken sailor? No. I'm simply saying I'm not here to teach you Christian behavior. I'm here to expose you to the glory of God. Not that we would stare at our own navels and ponder and dwell upon every imperfection, no, no, but rather that we would marvel over his perfect righteousness put on us. I'm not here to tell you to be a better Christian. I'm here to tell you that Christ is better than anything that you have and anything that you are settling for. I am here to take your hand and place it in his All that is left for you, Christian, being now saved, is how much deep joy and peace and hope and purpose would you like to walk in? Careful, Peter. You want to look at yourself this week? It's going to be a miserable week. You look at him, you're going to soar. You are going to mount up on wings as eagles. Isaiah 40. Now, what happens over time is, as you keep looking and you keep marveling at his perfect speech and his perfect life and his perfect love and mercy and grace and peace and compassion, you keep looking at and marveling over the gold stuff. Dude, you keep doing that, man. Your lesser, inferior appetites are going to become former appetites. And they are going to begin to fall off of you as you marvel over what is better. And listen, man, man, you understand this. The very best thing that you could ever do for the unbelieving community around you is to pursue Christ and delight in him. Do not judge them. The best thing that you can do for them is to pursue Christ and delight in him. Do not be an uptight Christian, okay? Do not be uptight Christians. Just pursue Christ and delight in him and let the unbelieving see you doing it. I'm not telling you to put on a show. I'm telling you to put on Christ so you don't have to. Now, if you have not Christ, then yeah, man, every idle word will condemn you because you do not have the covering of Christ. And look, man, if you want to settle for nothing plus nothing equals everything and call that intellectual integrity so you can unwittingly chart a course for ever-increasing despair and darkness, not really knowing anything about why you're here and what for. Man, knock yourself out, but that's just dumb. I am telling you there is better, way better, more better than you could possibly imagine. If you have not Christ, come and see me. What we can all ask ourselves in the quietness of our hearts this week, believing and unbelieving alike, is this. What are you settling for and why? When infinite joy is being offered to you. Why are you settling for less? Why are you settling for fear? What exactly is it that you are settling? Do you even know? Well, give a good listen to your 25,000 words today and find out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your continued pursuit, Lord. Thank you that you are after our marvel and our wonder and our delight and our apprehension of your glory and not our behavior. 
And thank you that you told us in the Sermon on the Mount, first seek the kingdom of God and his glory, all these other things. They'll, they'll be added to you. We'll, we'll get to that. I want your heart. I want you marveling over my excellence and value and worth. I want to be the preeminent treasure. I want to have sole possession of, of that throne on your heart. I want to be the highest affection so that you will clearly see all of this other mud and gunk for what it is and not be deceived and not be ripped off and not be joyless. Lord, thank you so much for your mercy, for your patience, for your perfection. God, you're so good. You, you, you're just better. You're better than anything we could possibly conceive of. Lead us by your glory into the fullness of joy, we pray, this week in Jesus' name. The people of God said, amen. Let's worship.